Now, if you have this posture, as well as you guys are going to do it with the other ones, remember this, remember this, you're going to do it with all three of them. I now want to start making a few points that should be happening in Bagua. These points are the same as happens in Tai Chi. They just may be a little difference in how they're done, but they're basically the same exact thing. So you have a subject of Lioha, so just stick your arms out like this. It's nice. So now we have the first thing. How does your elbow connect to your knees? Now, when you walk this way, the fact of the matter is that, in the sense of your back knee, did you all get this idea that your elbow, look here, look at my knee right now. You get the idea. As they bend, it's as though this is going down, that's going up, until your elbow and knee, through the center of your body, feel like they're one thing. There's not two things, and you don't have an elbow and a knee. You have this one combined unif unifying force. But now it gets a little bit better. So, the question now becomes, well, do you do it to your front of your back leg? Well, if you're in a position like this, clearly you're doing it with your back leg, that's your major focus. But if you shift forward, clearly you're doing it with your front leg. And when you bring both feet together, you're clearly doing it with both legs, okay? That's the kind of the basic principle that's involved. Good morning, Dominic. Hi. Now, does everybody understand this? Now we have the second thing that we did before, and that is your shoulder and your elbow. So the central point here is that, well here, I think I can show this easier on me. Nah, it doesn't matter. Watch, look at my, look at my shoulders. You wanna have a sense of not only your shoulders are dropping, but that your shoulders, if I exaggerate this, can you see the way my shoulders are kind of going right to my elbows? You should feel the dropping of your shoulders almost causing a flow of blood, a pressure that's going to go right to your elbows. So for a moment, just stick your arms up in here, just like this. It makes it easy to get the point now. Get your shoulders to drop and your elbows to drop until you literally can feel pressure build up in your elbow. Not much, a little. That's going to be synovial fluid. That's actually what it's going to be. Okay? Now, if you really get it really great, you know what happens next? The shoulder goes to the elbow, and then the fingers go up until the elbow flows into the fingertips. One last point about your palm. Can you all see my fingers? Let those fingertips bend right from here just a little bit. So there's a phrase. This goes for your spine, it goes for the, your elbows, it goes for your knees. And the phrase that's in Tai Chi Chen is actually basically the same principle as in Bagua. And the phrase in Chinese, Yi Shan Bei, Wu Gong, the body has five bows. Has five bows. Well, look at this. The spine is a real easy bow to figure out, right? You see the bowing of the spine, yes or no? Well, look at your arms. That's a bow, isn't it? That's a bow, and your legs are a bow. So you want to get all five of those bows activating. But for the moment, it's too much. You know what is enough? Just see if you can get from your palm to your fingertips, your fingertips just having a little bend like this, so you feel as though your hand has become a bow. Like, you know, twang. Everybody should find out when they hold a static arm posture. You know, like when you drive a stick shift, you have neutral? What is the neutral thing inside of you so you can release your arms? And everybody's got it. I mean, it could just be a way you think. It could be you relax your butt. It could be relax your foot. I don't know. But what is neutral so that here, Rather than being frozen, you get neutral and you can begin to start moving. You need to look for that place because it is the most single common thing when people hold static arm posture. After a while, it's like they want to let go of it, but their mind just starts going. <gasps> and there, there is a place where you don't extend out that far, but your mind is kind of very settled and relaxed and your hands are out. And as long as you stay there, one, that is good for meditation, but two, it also means when you have to go to the next thing, you don't have to overcome the resistance of everything going, foom. What I'm trying to say is that your nervous system 
you need to be in a neutral ground where when you're holding your arms out, you're not doing it by You have to have a place where you feel as though you could go anywhere, but you're keeping your arms out. Now, this is a very, very fine line, and it exists in a place in the mind and in the body where you can just relax, your nerves can open up, but they don't go the extra step of pushing. Because once your nerves push, right, basically they have a hard time coming back. That is the basic situation with people who have a tendency toward becoming manic. Do you know what I mean, manic? Manic depressive? Bipolar? Well, that's the one side. Then again, if you're gonna, if you were gonna do, there are, po there are closing postures that are done. We're not gonna particularly do those. But the fact that it matters is that if you have everything coming in and you can't have it to where it's relaxed coming in, then you start getting in where you only, 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 only go in. And that is very similar to things like depression, grief, sorrow, and all those really ones that make you like almost feel like you're going to collapse, get on the floor, crawl underneath the chair and never come out again. So you have to realize that these are to a certain degree, forgetting about the cause of the depression or, or, or the hyperness, the nervous system takes on a certain type of a shape and a flow. And if that flow starts going, the line between what is a cause and what is a symptom gets terribly blurred. It's hard to tell which, what is what. It's hard to tell if it's your nerves going out or making you go crazy, or you went crazy, then your nerves couldn't stop going out. So the central point is that there is a middle space. There is a middle space where your nerves are out, you're fully going out, but you're able to come in if you want to, or if you're coming in, there's a middle space to where even if you're having everything very strong going in, you can go out. And that becomes very strong in a single palm change. Because what you see is the way people go out and their hand collapse, and they do this and that, it's because they don't have the middle space. Even if you know what you're supposed to do, if you don't have the middle space, you have one of two things when you get so far. Either you can't come back, or what usually happens is then people collapse. And that doesn't work either. That doesn't work either when people collapse their arms and collapse in. So I just want you to get there is a middle space between ah or ooh. And that space in your nervous system is something you want to look for until you find it. Because that ultimately is one of the things that's absolutely critical to move between any yin and yang change in Bagua. It's very, very important. Okay, next. With the, um, with the co-postures, I found I could um, lock into and open up some really deep knots that have been there a long time. Yeah. And as they opened up, I got a sense of a lot more space opening up inside of my body. Sure, that's normal. Business as usual. I would also state something that is also the opposite side, that when you get something closing down that opens up space, eventually it's also going to be when you twist out it's also going to open up yet more, but it's only going to open up. You're only going to open up as much inside as you opened up the space outwardly. You're only going to open up as much outwardly as you first opened up the space inwardly for that projection to, to go from. That's a very, very critical issue. Yes? Um, I find that um, using what you said about growing the tree, I was mm -hmm. able to hold up a lot longer than I thought. Mm -hmm. but then at some point the energy just like I lost I don't have enough energy so while you're holding these postures can you I don't know grab energy from the earth or the air you can grab energy from the earth but I wouldn't recommend doing it uh -huh. because you're probably going to move in a strain and I don't think it's worth it what I think is worth it is that if you when you finally start getting a sense of part of the 70 percent rule is 70 percent of your stamina because when you're saying I don't have energy what you're saying is your stamina is gone if you start seeing that you're approaching 70% or when you kind of feel you're at 70%, don't hold it up there until you start collapsing. Hold it up there until you start feeling, uh-oh, it's starting to move forward. It's going from 70 to 80 or 80 to 85. And then don't wait till it hits 100. When you're starting to see that it's moving up, well, then just bring it back in again. And that's a much better thing because it's, it's quite common. This posture especially, right? If you take what this posture is at its first stage, it basically is about 
letting the whole inside of your body open up. But at a certain point, that requires a certain amount of energy to keep it up. And then there are other things, just, just to give you an example to go with this, it's not part of this course, but it is part of the subject. That, okay, so you get out. Now just watch me. You bring your energy back into your core. You shove it out from your core. You take it into the core, you take it out, or you just twist your arms. And in that process, you make all this stuff go this way. That's another way that you start building up the energy to actually keep your arms up longer. Okay? But it's not really, that's more of a level three subject than level two. Okay. Anybody else? Or we're onwards and forwards. You're all probably familiar, if you wanted to hit a baseball farther, you would just visualize yourself going through hitting it until, and then you might do better. But no, what I really want you to do, lie down, make you put yourself in a completely comfortable position, however you can rest. And as you go through what you're going to do in your head, I want you to relax until you feel it streaming through the nerves of your body. So you can feel your leg doing it, but without physically moving. I want you to try and get as relaxed as you can possibly get and run through, oh, let's see, I'm going, oh, that's right, my hands are going up, they're out here, I'm walking, go through it. Just so you go through it a few times to where you're very, very clear what you're doing. You will find you will innately hit resistance inside your nervous system to doing this. <laughs> You'll want to feel like your leg is going forward, but like all of a sudden you'll feel something to here, but not down to the end of your leg. To one degree, what you are experiencing are the neural pathways in your body. You're simply all, anytime any of us remember something, there are all these little dendrites and electrical signals that have to set up a steady pattern in the body for the body to remember it. So in one sense, what you're simply doing is patterning them. But then when you've done this, whatever you think you need to do, either what's that day or what's been hard for you, very often by just doing this, you, if you can keep on working it through again and again to where it feels like you're hitting resistance but then it goes clean, you will have gotten it. But then let your mind go blank, relax, and go to sleep. And your nervous system will basically keep on working on it all night long. That's what will happen. And it'll take, it'll, it'll just make, God knows how many little neural connections inside your body, but it works. It really, really works. Or anyway, you can make the experiment and find out if it works, which is more the way I would advocate it. Okay, I mean, I've personally done this a lot in my life and it works like a charm. Okay? Now, let's look at the second posture, static arm posture. This posture is like this. Can you see how my arms are twisting inward? That's a question. You see how my legs are slightly twisting inward as a general proposition? Your hands twist in and the idea is that you're taking the chi from outside your body, you're twisting it in and you're using it to take you into your lower dandian and then literally you want to have the sense of you're holding the energy in your lower dandian. Now what's very important in this is to make sure that your armpits don't collapse because if your armpits collapse, the chi flow from your left and right channels is going to get blocked going to your hands. So your armpits have to stay open, your arm has to stay open. You remember the wrapping thing? Remember? Wrapping front to back. You have that and you walk this way. And you simply walk in a circle this way and that's it. Now as you get better and you turn, you want to look toward the center of the circle. But until you get 45 degrees, just look straight ahead. But then when you go to 45 to 90, start letting your eyes move toward the center of the circle. Now, one of the things you're going to notice is that there are, three, there are four points I'd like you to concentrate on. That'll be terribly useful. And there are four points when you teach students you want them to be careful about. The order, what's one, two, and three, hard to say. Case by case, you have to just see what's going on. One is that, do you, can you very clearly get that sense of a flow? Remember how we just did that with the shoulder, elbow, fingers? Can you get a very clear sense that there is a flow going into your fingertips? Blood, energy, okay? 
The second thing that's very important is that you are holding your energy in your lower dandian. Okay? That's the main point of the posture. The third thing is that after you have the sense of the energy really getting to your fingertips, can you continuously keep it in your toes, the tips of your toes? When you get all those together, can you continuously have a sense at the very top of your head as though there's a sense of energy or blood or pressure? Right, look at me. If you take a line over from the back of your head to your nose and over here, the name of the point in Chinese is called Bai Hui, or the meaning of 100 acupuncture channels, but it's the place where all the yang meridians of your body kind of come to a, a peak. This peak up here should eventually really be balanced by your toes and balanced by your fingertips because when all three of those places have a clear sense of energy, most likely your energy is circulating through your body or would block in one of the extremity points. And of course, the lower dandian. So this is the point of this, to try now to very deliberately in the second posture, make sure that your energy gets to your five extremities and that you begin to awaken your lower dandian. Okay? How are we doing? Inward turn with the arms, inward turn with the legs, slightly inward turn with the legs. And on top of that inward turn, then you'll do any inward or outward twisting you're going to do with your leg. Uh, maybe, maybe um, oh, let me see, let me do this again so make sure it makes sense. This is a neutral position with my legs. Just watch me. Just look. Can you see the legs? Pretty big, should be reasonably visible. So I start from the neutral position. I could twist my legs in, twist my legs out, yes? I also can do something else, watch me. Did you see how I have a little twisting in? Now from that twisting in point, I can twist out and I can twist in more and I can twist out and I can twist in more. That's what you're after in this one. It's a little bit of a twist in and then from that baseline, you twist in and twist out according to the steps of walking. Now, here's the point. Beside the arms going out, I want you to do this with each other's arms. Do you see I did a slight inward twist? I want you to do this so they get the feeling of what this is like, not as an idea in their head, but as a physical reality. See, I'm twisting their hands in slightly, twisting it in, so at the center of your palms face your lower dandian. Now this twisting should do something. If you'll turn around, Paul, turn around. Put your hands here. The twisting watches back. This twisting like this should open his back up and get his spine to raise. Yes? That's part of it. How are we doing? Twist arms, raise spine. Is that obvious? I'm not touching his back. You're noticing his back go up. It is simply because flesh is connected to flesh through ligaments, through fascia, through, frankly speaking, through a whole legion of blood vessels, although not, it's not as strong as the fascia. The fascia is the easiest one. Has everyone got the point? Now next, it's also the fact that, so what are we gonna do here? We're gonna go, okay, Paul, here's your legs, and I'm now just gonna twist it in just, just a little bit. Now, okay, now, Paul, twist out, twist in, and you just do that. You just put your hands on them so they can feel if it's happening or not, because it's very difficult to know. Let's put it this way, the easiest way for a human body, as well as for human eyes, to know if something is occurring is contrast. Television, if it has taught us nothing else, has taught us that. And movies. It's all about contrast. That's all it is. Okay, so have you got the idea? Let's go to one more thing, and now we're going to go to your third posture. And there's a few things about this which need to be looked at. Number one is that here... You start off, so this was your second posture, yes? Now watch me. So I'm gonna first show you what the shell is. The shell first and then we fill the wallet. Good name for whatever, you know. Fill the glass full of water, put the wine in the glass, the champagne, whatever you wanna call it. I've always talked about the bottle and the champagne or the bottle and the wine. Doesn't matter. You wanna get real American? The wallet and the money, <laughs> okay? No, well, hell, euros will work as well. We take euros, it's okay. All right, now look. You see this? Just the shell, the most bare shell. Can you see my hands? What did I do here? What were my arms doing? They were twisting in, weren't they? Everything into your dandian. Can you remember that? Now, 
everything is going to go out. You can do it this way, or it's even stronger if you do it this way. See the edge of my hand? Out. And this takes the energy that's in your dandian, and the objective is to get your hand about the height in the midpoint between your lower dandian and your diaphragm, about here. Yes? That'll open up the mid, the mid, the mid spine. It will also, it will also, the object is to take your insides and literally go out. So one took everything in, everything in while you did what? Watch me. Everything in, as your whole body opened up inward, now what's going to happen? Your whole body is going to open up to the outside. Your hands give or take end with the edge of your hand on the outside, somewhere, I don't know, somewhere out here, give or take. Now, another point. The first posture, the second posture, just so you guys get, I'm filling in stuff for you with them, okay? But I'm telling them what they need to know, and I told you stuff when they weren't present because you need to know that, but bear in mind, they go together. You know, one plus one equals two, you know, higher math. Now, here we go. So you have the sense of your body really opening up, but let me take one step back. When you first start walking, you need to get your breathing going. Now, ideally, in this modern day and age, in the old days, they taught people how to breathe doing Bhagwan or doing one of the other practices, doing a Qigong practice or doing Tao Yoga or doing something. Nowadays, people have a hard time, but I'm telling you, because almost all of you here know how, to, know how to do Taoist breathing. Most, all of you, longevity breathing. So get this. The first posture when you walk, really make sure that your breath, right? Make sure that your breath is really going in the whole front of your body. When you go to this posture, have the sense of your breath, not just moving up here, but condensing your breath into your internal organs. Does everybody get that? Condense it. Condense it into your internal organs. Now, this one here, beside opening up your belly, this one should start getting to where you're breathing. This motion here gets your breathing to go into your sides, your liver and your spleen. You all got that? so that you want to know, okay, so you focus on your breath there until eventually you can be moving at the fastest speed you're going and your breathing mechanism gets hardwired into physical movements. Or in other words, you get used to taking your breathing, doing actions in life and not just sitting in a chair or something, okay? Which is actually a whole other practice because most people stop breathing when they sit in chairs if you want to get right down to it. There's a phrase in Taoism, if there's the front, there's the back. If you look at the I Ching, up, down, left, right, front, back, in, out. That kind of sums it up. Now, most of you are not used to, when you expand out this way, Craig, can you just come here for a second? The mind will naturally, in most people, not everybody, but I would say 99.99% of the population, you, all your attention goes to what's in front of you. Do you understand? Your hands are in front here. This is where you are. That's only half the story. The more your hands go away from your body, no matter how they go away from your body, something else has to happen. As his hands go out this way forward, you have to have an equal sense of your back going back. Your whole spine and back going backwards. There's a very well-known phrase in Chinese they use for politics or business. They say, oh, they, they, have, they, own, they have all front but no back, which means all they have is a big show. They have a big image, but there's nothing behind it whatsoever. That's a classic term for don't trust the son of a bitch, okay? Or don't depend on him, whether you trust him or not. So as long as there's the back, your spine. So now what I want you all to do is just for a moment with your hands before you stand up, just do this. Just take your hands right now. And as your hands go forward, I want you to have the feeling of your back going backwards, but in equal proportion to each other. So that otherwise, your, the tendency of your hand to go forward eventually is going to lead to this. 
But if it goes back and forth at the same time, you can remain straight without there being a problem. Okay? So we just take for this one. So here, let's do it again. Twist in, yes? Twist out. Twist in, twist out. What was this one? Twist in. What's this one? Twist out. Twist out. Doesn't have, not this way, with the edge. It is because the edge, the edge, will strengthen your liver more than this one will. More than the palm out. It's only for that reason. Just try it. I mean, literally, if you have the ability to have the body feeling, get the sense of, you know, your liver ends over here. As your hand's moving out, get the sense of your liver chomp, expanding all the way to back here is kind of where it ends. Look where I'm finishing. Look here. Some of you just ask, come here, Isaac, because you're asking about martial arts. This thing is used all the time. This motion, bam, there go his ribs. Or you're walking past somebody, just boom, right down there. Or you're walking back at somebody, your hand just goes here, bam, and breaks their spine. Very common move. Very, very common move. You can do it with your forearm too, but you should, you should use the edge of your hand. You only you use your forearm high up. You don't use it low down because people clump and your arm gets stuck in them. That's kind of what happens. Put your hands like this. Get your edges to go out. And then just let your hand go down a little bit. Get your edges of your hand to go out and your, your thumbs to go down slightly. That's what it's about. And it's, a, it's wider than your ribs. It's out here somewhere. And again, your hand, the edge of your hand is approximately at the height, somewhere between your diaphragm and your lower dandian. In other words, here. And those of you who are into anatomy, that's where most of your digestive organs are located. You know, all that stuff that has to flow around, the junctions, the sphincters, all that. Dual duodenal junction and those other kind of things. Now, now we do the next thing, huh? So now think of the old balloon. The balloon? The balloon is blowing up, but the balloon has to blow up kind of, you also want to feel this action eventually going all the way to the top of your neck and your feet. So your legs and your feet feel when you're going like this, that they're going broop. And part of what this is about is really opening up the blood vessels of your body, your vascular system. And you just have to get to the point that if you let your hand go loose, there should be this kind of outward pressure with the edge of your hand. Okay? You got the idea, yeah or nay? Remember, breathing, huh? For this third posture, where is it? And, but when you breathe from the sides, do you also breathe from the front? Yes. When your hands are going forward, where else are you going? Backward? Front has back. Front has back. Okay? Now, this next posture is very specifically for opening up the area in your body where your chi splits from your left to your right hand. It is very specifically about opening up the heart, okay? And it just is a posture that's in the middle of your body. Now, I should mention that as you keep on going, this thing is also used as you hold it just to, there's also twisting of the hands that happens. It's also terribly useful for the opening and closing techniques that go on. These are all part of it. I don't know if we're going to have time to get to it, but if we do, it's going to be next week. It sure isn't going to be this week. So again, everything I said about the back opening is the truth. Now just look. What's the position? I'm only saying this is a classic Taoist greeting. One palm out, one palm in. Okay? It's also done both palms out. It's also done both palms in. But look at the book, because that's the one I want you to do. Huh? It's both palms out, yes. There we go. I'm just explaining those are, those are other variations of it that are on it. 
So here, now the trick of it is this. Oh, I have to show this. All right, Craig, come here. You're going to be better because you can kind of kneel down a bit. Just kneel down and put your finger right in the center of my palm. Just kneel down. Put your finger right in the center of my palm. Tell them as I am walking right now what's happening to the center of my palm. It's closing and opening. Closing and opening. It's now pulsing e lightly. Now, even if I don't make my hands move that much, tell them what's happening, Craig. There's less movement, but you can feel the inside pulsing more. There's a lot of movement inside the center of the hand. And it should actually happen with the back one also. Part of what's hmm, an essential ingredient of this posture, let me not go into it. If I were going the whole thing, honestly, this, this would be the next week just dealing with this one alone, that you're looking to, right in the center of your palm, getting the ability of the energy from your feet and from your lower dandian to literally just start making the, the palm go boom, 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 boom. The Lao Gong point in the palm is the correspondent to your three dandians. Your lower dandian, your middle dandian, and your brain, it comes out through the center of the palm. Most of all, a lot of this etheric healing, all sorts of body healing comes out through here. You'll see it classically in all sorts of icon and artwork. The eye of the Buddha shows this and shows an eye painted. It's because these exactly go to the three main energy centers in the body. And what you're trying to do is one, this particular position like this, it, it gets this. Can you, see, can you see what this is doing to my spine? Look. It really gets that open in the hands. But more than that, the purpose of this posture is actually to connect your palm to your three dandians. That's really what its most important thing is. The most important one being first to get your lower dandian. The middle one's quite a bit harder. Now, it is also held directly in front of the heart because we all know the importance of the heart in the human body, especially in terms of circulation of blood. So it's held. This is exactly, this is what they call a classic middle, this is one of, well, it's one of a series of classic middle dandian postures. So have you all got that, yay or nay? This is not it, this, is, this one's here, okay? One of the things about this in terms of meditation, I just talked about chi. In terms of meditation, there is the thought. In general, excuse me, generally in Chinese thought, as well as in Tibetan, that they think that the center of consciousness in the body is in the heart. Now they think this mostly not because that's entirely accurate. Because the mind, the spirit actually doesn't really have a center. It, it really doesn't. It, it doesn't have a, it's really truly non-local. But what is true is that when people die, and this is held both in Taoism and in Buddhism, that in general when a person dies, this is the root they go out of their head. They go right from their heart out their head and that's how they leave the body. That's the consciousness that is capable of moving after death somewhere. That's more or less where it resides, which is actually not quite the same thing as it's where your spirit or mind resides. And that wouldn't be accurate, but it is the place from which when you eject out of the body, it's the route you go through. This center of consciousness also in the middle of the heart has a second effect. It has an incredibly calming and smoothing effect on all human emotion. Now specifically its most valuable use in today's modern age is that it calms down anxiety, which originates actually from the physical organ of the heart. And given that the prevailing disease of the modern age is anxiety, given that anxiety is so intimately linked with every form of stress, this is kind of an important posture. So the Chinese are, China as a large cultural entity, China is a Confucian culture. Confucians are classification freaks, I'm telling you. They will classify things down to the smallest degrees you can imagine. And this whole business about is your, is your right hand forward, your left hand forward, look. I personally say go with your intuition 
Because part of the reason why they put, well, a woman should put her right hand, a man should put her left hand, of course, but when they're going counterclockwise, they should reverse it. A lot of that is nothing more than the Chinese desire to classify things and to make it simple. The truth is, and now we get down to the reality of the whole thing, is that let your natural instinct about where your hand should be and if you turn around, if you want to change it, fair enough, and go for whether or not that opens up everything to your Laogong point. I would not get so hung up about whether your left or your right hand is in front. I think this is nothing more than a particular cultural bias. No more, no less. And I've not seen it makes that big a difference. As a general rule, though, it's, it's quite useful eventually to recognize that usually if you go clockwise around a circle or counterclockwise around a circle, that it actually can help if one hand is in front of another. Not all the time, but a lot of the time. But that you've got to find exper experientially, experimentally. The higher your hands go, the easier it becomes to disconnect your shoulder, your shoulder notch, to have it open. If you have your hands down here, if your hands are here, your hands are here, it's a lot harder. It's easier to keep your shoulders notch out, but as a matter of fact, this is the easiest way, because you've got gravity. And if you just look at the way your body's going, you're basically flowing in the direction from your spine. The higher your hands get up in the air, the more the ability to keep your, whether it be here or higher, the more you're gonna have to really have control over your spine to open up your shoulders nest. But I would also state that the higher your hand goes, the more it becomes important to get the flow from the armpit into the internal organs because without that, Without releasing the internal organs from the armpit, your hands, your shoulder notch will not be able to open up and you will effectively block the energy moving from your spine to your fingertips. So the lower postures, like for example, what you've done just so far, the first four, you're still at a height where it's pretty easy. Up to about here, you can open your shoulders nest and your back just from your spine fairly easily. As you move higher, you have to get some motion from your armpits into your guts. There's no two ways about it. Now, let me just to show you what the basic position is. Paul Craig, somebody, I just need someone who's tall. I also want to make the point that as your, as your shoulder's nest opens, can you see this? Look at my pelvis. As your shoulder's nest opens, the more your pelvis has to come around and squeeze into the front. So the opening of the shoulders notch and the thing that's called Leotun Si Kwa and Bagua are a match pair, okay? They, 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 they must happen together. They never should separate from each other. Each one enables or inhibits the other. So now, if we look where your hands are like this, this is the first point I want to have you get. Look at the, my elbows. Watch what my elbows are doing. Forget my hands for a moment. Look at the elbows. Did you all watch the way they went under and forward? Yes or no? They went down here. Come here, Craig. You do it nice. Come over here. So I want each of you just having a hand on the elbow so that this way, if someone's eyes are not good at seeing this, there's no way they can miss it. So just put, put, put one palm just underneath my elbow. Here, actually, grab the skin. It'll be better. Just grab the skin. Grab the skin. Watch. Now look. Watch. Down. under, up, and forward. Get the first part, because this, this is the hardest part in a lot of ways. Look, do you see the down, yes or no? But then it's that, it's two things are happening. One is that they're going forward, the other one is they're going up. And your hands finish, give or take, uh, around your throat, give or take, okay? Now. There are several things about this. So one of you stand here, because now I gotta just like manipulate bodies a little bit. Go and do that, Paul. So now let's do the seal. Let's actually have you face sideways. So now, as his hands move forward, go ahead, 
his butt wraps, closes in, especially at the last part where he goes, do it again, Paul. Here, your shoulders notch is opening in what direction? Freeze, downward. Now, as your hands come up, it goes forward. So it goes down and then forward. How are we doing? Now with all this, as he does that again, a few more points just to repeat which have been done before but which should not be forgotten. Let's do it again, Paul. Central issue here, can you all see him? Is he at a good angle for all of you? Here we go. Da -da 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 -da. Down boy, go. The more you go down and the more you go forward, the more your shoulder's nest goes in. How are we doing? That's important. Equally, again, let's do it again. One more time. The more, the more you go down as your belly tucks, the more your quad hollows in. How are we doing? The more the quad hollows in. Now you have a very basic relationship, and this is now the second or third time we've gone through this, and that is your shoulders and your hips must join. Now, I want to make this to a few points. The shoulders nest opening up, sorry, the, th sorry, the, the shoulders notch opening up is directly tied into the whole business of your pelvis tucking under and you're squeezing in front here. Do you got that? Because let's look at this. What is the point of the shoulders notch opening? The chi from your torso gets to your fingertips. Yes or no? You got that? What is the point of your pelvis doing Leotum C qua? <clears throat> your chi gets to your toes. So now if we look at this thing here, if he puts his arms out like this, I, normally I'll do this with, with, with a smaller person. I, I'm just not in the mood to do it right now. But can you notice that if he were to flip upside down, his fingers and his toes are basically the same thing? Your arms and your legs coming out of your spine. If any of you want a good demonstration, do it with someone light. But what I normally done, you've all, I just take a woman usually because it's easier. Or I take someone who's about that high. I just pick him up and hold him up in the air and just like make his feet move to make the points the same as the hands. No, because when you say it intellectually, this is about teaching, when you say it intellectually to some people, oh yeah, my arms are the same as my feet. <laughs> Goes right past them. You might, you might as well tell them, you know, uh, a three-page long physics formula. It go, they say it once and it's erased. But if you do something, if you're able to, and you're strong enough and you get somebody, even you get two people, you hold somebody upside down with their feet and you just start going, hey, like that's your hand. And you go, that's your, that's your shoulders notch. If you make it that visible, most people don't get that their arms and legs are essentially the same thing and the point is that they must directly correspond to each other. So the basic correspondence are, just shooting through it quick, are that your shoulders nest and your qua here, right? The sense of your shoulders being down here and the sides, the bones right here with your pelvis going down. So there should be the sense of your shoulders literally <coughs> sinking right to your hips. Do you got that? Armpit sinking to the hips. But now we have last but not least, which in some ways is the most important and what is ultimately necessary for the spine to really reach its full length. And that is your shoulder blades have to sink down to the cheeks of your butt. Now if you do this and you just have this sense of not letting your head go down but leaving your head there, you let the sinking happen, look. If you let the sinking go down your back, the vertebrae of your back will stretch until they finally reach your butt, which will stretch down. And the effect of that will be to probably add about that much distance throughout your entire spine. I mean, you've got 30 vertebrae, so, you know, figure it. But the fact of the matter is that, just look at me right now, just look. Paul, just hold the top of my head so it's terribly obvious my head's not going down. Not the ears. Do the jaw, please. I mean, it's horrible in the ears. Watch. Did you all see that? Yes or no? This goes, it drops down, and what's lengthening is the spine. 
because your spine in Bagua always lengthens one of two ways. It lengthens down or it lengthens up. Those are the only two ways your spine can go. Okay? How are we doing? Yes, no? So now we go back to what we are doing before. Let's come over here and just face 45. It's a nice angle. Everybody can see it. His elbows go down. They first come in. Do you see this coming in? And then they go under and forward. They raise. They raise up slightly so that your hand finishes give or take around your throat. How are we doing? So let's do it again. So first your hands, and how do they come in? How do they come in? Put your hands back there again, Paul. They come in because from your shoulders, through your forearms, to your hands, your hands are twisting, your arms are twisting in, right? Now, very commonly when your hands will go out, if you've got a really good twist in, you can twist out to bring them out because that's always a balancing action. A twist in with a twist out. So he comes in this way, and now let's get two things. Up, forward. So he goes up and forward at the same time, and as he goes up and forward, let's come back here, he makes sure that the energy from his entire spine and dropping his elbows into his hands starts moving the cheat really down his arm, not only into his fingertips, but this particular posture, as in all of these, his energy has to go to four places, actually five. His fingertips, the inside of his hand here, so that those of you in the martial arts and all that kind of stuff, that's called you have the ability to stick your thumbs right through, shall we say, a part of someone's body they would prefer it not to be stuck into. Okay? You have that, you have the edge. See this thing? Look basically what I'm also doing with my hands. It's called searing somebody's neck through. Okay? But the most important one, beyond a shadow of a doubt, the two most important are the fingers is forward, which opens up the shoulders nest, and this is up. This again is tall. So that the classic thing, and I can remember when I first did this with Wang Xu Jing, because I swear to God I thought I was going to cry. Okay, he just went like this. And he just had someone talking, and the person was translating to me in Japanese, put your hands up. And he had me just walking the circle, and he just went like this. Come on, let's walk, let's walk, come on. <laughs> now, <laughs> You'd be surprised how heavy Wangs are, and then again, you could be surprised just how heavy my arm can get if I have a mood to. Come on, come on, walk, come on. Come on. It's impossible. And these were the type of phrases that were entered at that moment. I'm going back to the thing. Come back here again. You're going to walk. I'll make it easy. Oh. Uh. Huh. Old woman, are we? <laughs> are you expecting to die in the next month? <laughs> How feeble are you? <laughs> no, I'm just expecting to die in the next two minutes. <laughs> and of course, you do realize that if you fall down, I'm going to slam you to the floor and your head's going to bounce on it. <laughs> and these were things he just said as he walked and he was explaining this and that. And all the time he had this cane in his hand. And he was just kind of... <laughs> it was motivation. <laughs> Now, as you will notice, Paul did Now, he was going to do the same thing to me, but I want to make the thing that you have to get. There are two issues. If anyone ever does that to you, or if you wish you do it to yourself, you do it on me. Go ahead. It's okay. I'll just walk. Okay. So what it is, is that it's, one is getting to your hand out, and that's your spine. But the second one, come on, Paul. The second one is that the weight here, you just take it right through your armpits into your belly. And if it compresses your belly, you don't feel any weight on you whatsoever. So you have two separate issues. You have out from the spine and you have into your belly. The weight should be borne by your belly, not by your spine. The outwardness of your hand should be borne by your spine and not by your belly. Just mentioning this, not saying that you will may walk away doing it, nor will you be tested on this, but I thought it was a nice thing you should know that exists. So go ahead, Paul. Ugh. I'll just be nice. I'll just have my... It's been very nice. <laughs> See where I ask. Keep walking, Paul. But if I was now to do what I just suggested with him, <clears throat> that's called taking it down to your belly. That's called dropping your chi to your belly, which has a very noticeable effect. Okay, how are we doing? If you all got this.
This is above and beyond what the specific postures do. At different heights, your body gels. It unifies. Can you hear me? And you can have your body very unified here, but you stick your hands up here and you're not terribly unified. So a simple way of putting it is just watch. Okay, here you go, right? Now you're higher. Yes? How are we doing? Now. You're higher still. Now you're higher. And then finally, you're going to be higher still. Part of what this is doing, A, is unifying your body at the different levels it needs to be unified. But a second thing it's doing is that these first beginning static arm postures are starting to give you the ability to raise your energy up your body and keep your mind quiet and still. They have those, they have that. It starts with down here, right, where you really kind of get it, and then you kind of get over here, and it just continues all the way up the line. This comes the heart. When you when you get up, when you basically when you get when you get about up to here, excuse me, this does it for the third eye, and it goes up to when you're up to here, it actually causes the quiet cry of the head. But each of those going up is meant from a, a, a meditation point of view to get your energy rising and at each level give your mind the time to become stable and still and settle into itself. Because your mind when it settles into your body, it also settles into itself a certain degree. And that's important. Okay? How are we doing? So this one is really simple. There we go. Well, here, look. It's this. Now again, you have the motion here of tor, the lifting the sense of rising. The most single important part about this, can, is it, can you come here, Paul? No, you, cause you, don't, or you can do it next, you have to, have to take your shirt off. Look, if you look at that picture, where is the person's forearms? Where are my forearms and arms? They're on the left and the right channels. Yes or no? They're on the left and the right channels. If you get this, the bigger, the issue is that your chi, usually it's first done at this height, so your chi reaches your throat, and then it's done to where you kind of get to here, where your chi reaches your third eye. The next one, you're going to go with your hands all the way up in the air. Now, I should mention something. Remember that business how I said that it goes from your shoulders to your elbows and up to your fingers? This is a stinker of a posture because this is the hardest possible way. You're, this is the... This, excuse me. This is the highest degree of difficult your body is going to get to make it happen. It's actually easier to have your hands straight up. It really is. This one, because the nature of the bend, your chi really has to reach your fingertips. Now going back to the previous one, the throat's fine, and then very commonly what some people will do, just up to here, is then just raise it higher up to the third eye. You following me? You could go from here and go straight up to here, but you also can do the middle if you want. And that's fine on your test also. But if you go for the middle, bear in mind it has to be that your energy has to stabilize at this height before you go up. So that by the time you finish the end of this basic series of postures and your hands up to here, excuse me, then your chi better damn well be at the top of your head. Can you all follow me? Because that's what it's meant to do. Just as later on, you're going to do the single palm change. Well, well, if you do this, but your chi couldn't reach the top of your head, frankly speaking, I don't know why your hand was going higher than this to begin with. 